or for prospective colleges. We are so appreciative of your interest in joining the ATD network. And we have a great crowd with us today. We have 83, um, 83 people on the phone with us from about 56 colleges. So we're thrilled to have all of you with us. We hope today that you're going to leave this webinar with a clear understanding of what the ATD network is, some of the benefits and the services that we offer through um, ATD, a good understanding of the application process, and we want to answer every question that you might have um, about what the ATD network is, what we do, and um, how you'll benefit from being part of this network. Before we get started um, on this webinar, I wanted to just run through the technology uh, quickly. You'll see um, on your screen, you'll be able to see the attendee list and see everyone who is with us on the webinar today. And that's um, there's section A on that slide right there. And if at any time you have a question, please feel free to enter the question into the box um, on your screen. That's under section D here. We'll, we've saved plenty of time at the end of the presentation to take questions. But please, if you have questions pop up during the presentation, um, write them in, and we'll be happy to take them at that time. So I'm Mary Harrell. I'm Associate Director of Programs and Policy here at Achieving the Dream. And I'm joined by several of my colleagues today who will be part of the presentation. Julia Lawton is our Assistant Director of Programs. Cindy Linhart is our Vice President for Community College Relations. And Carol Lincoln is our Senior Vice President here at ATB. The way that we have structured the webinar today, um, we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about the history of ATD and the future of ATD. We, we're in the midst of a strategic planning process, so we would like to share with you um, the directions we'll be taking. We'll talk about um, the Achieving the Dream results and talk about the benefits and the services we offer through Achieving the Dream, um, talk a little bit about the structure um, for the fees associated with the network. And then we'll spend time going through the application itself um, and talking about the process and the criteria for being part of the network. Um, and then, as I said, we'll have plenty of time for questions and answers during the presentation. And we've saved time at the end as well. So with that note, I'd like to turn this over to Carol Lincoln, our senior vice president, who's going to talk a little bit about the history of ATD um, and about the work that we do now. Carol? Thank you, Mary. And thank you to all of you who are on this webinar. The, um, the slide that's before you is um, one that I doubt there's anybody on this webinar who's going to refute what is here. Uh, certainly, community colleges are an essential component of our society. And they're absolutely critical in our goal of trying to restore the United States as a leader in the, in the, across the globe in terms of higher education degree attainment. You probably also know that nearly half of all students who are in higher education are enrolled at community college. And that that is the portal that the majority of low-income students and students of color use to get access to higher ed. Certainly large numbers of community college students end up transferring into baccalaureate programs. So this is a key entry point. It's, it's a place where students can make it or break it in terms of realizing their dreams for a better life and uh, a, an education that really helps them to support their family and helps them realize their dreams. The sad truth, however, is that fewer than half of the students who start their higher education experience in community college end up earning a degree or a credential even six years after their first enrollment. And those numbers are even worse for students who come from low-income backgrounds or students of color. These, these are the reasons Achieving the Dream was invented, because so many students use community college, because it's such a critical institution, and because, unfortunately, while these institutions have been tremendously successful with an access agenda, we've done less well in terms of a success agenda where we can actually point to very high levels of attainment of credentials that matter in the workplace and that prepare people for satisfying and rewarding lives. Next slide, please. Achieving the Dream was created back in 2004 by the Lumina Foundation as the initial investor. They searched for seven national organizations 
that together had expertise that the foundation thought would matter is they tried to create a new initiative that would tackle this problem of increasing student success at the community college level. The seven organizations were research organizations. They were uh, organizations that had experience working in institutional change or with policy development or with public engagement or with evaluation. And together, those seven founding partners and the Lumina Foundation started designing and implementing what we now know as achieving the dream. After about a five-year demonstration period where more and more colleges were being added to the mix, there was convincing evidence that the strategies we were using in achieving the dream were actually making a difference. They were building the capacity of community colleges to bump up completion rates and other milestones among students' experience. And so a decision was reached to move from this model of founding partners to creating an independent, freestanding, nonprofit organization called Achieving the Dream, Inc., which would become the group that would 24-7 focus on the issue of increasing community college student success. The seven founding partners continue to be good partners with ATD, Inc., uh, but the decision-making, the responsibility for implementation, the responsibility for recruiting and serving colleges now rests with our nonprofit organization. At this point in time in our history, there have been over 200 colleges that have participated in Achieving a Dream. We've got a footprint in 35 different states, including the District of Columbia. We've got over 15 state policy teams. And you can see on this slide that's before you now, we're spread across the country in such a way that the, the programs and the policies that are being used in Achieving the Dream are having an impact, or have the potential to impact, at least 3.8 million of community college students. That's almost half of all the community college students in the country. The, the network is one of the key powers and strategies that we have for driving change. It's the idea of working together across the country on this issue. It's the idea of learning from one another, of having what works in one college being shared and spread with other colleges and with other states. That is really making this possible for this to have momentum and for the Achieving the Dream Network to be able to have a strong voice across the country on how to improve student success. We've recently engaged in strategic planning, and we've updated our vision for our work. You see on the screen our new vision, which is a nation that includes community colleges that are highly valued for preserving not only access agenda, but also assuring that their students, including and especially low-income students and students of color, achieve their goals for academic success, personal growth, and economic opportunity. This is not a, a radical departure from the vision that we had before, but we wanted to clarify exactly what we meant so that people understood we're not focusing only on low-income students and students of color, although we do make them a special emphasis because of the challenges they face. And we don't focus only on academic success, we want to make sure that students who come to community colleges also have the opportunity for personal growth and that their economic opportunities are increased by virtue of the attainment of credentials and skills that they get at the community college. We started long ago uh, looking at our core values, and these have not changed over time either. We fundamentally are about equity as well as about excellence. We do not believe that it is necessary to water down uh, programs that, achieve, that uh, colleges, community colleges offer their students. We believe that all students can succeed at community college at a high level given the proper opportunities and supports. And so we 
believe that it's the college's responsibility for figuring out what are those supports, what are those strategies that students need in order to be successful. What policies that the college may have do we need to change? What practices and behaviors and beliefs need to be changed at the college level in order to make it possible for all students to be successful? So we talk very much about equity, about making sure that every student gets the support they need in order to be successful. We also talk a lot about our work being student-centered. It's the reason we were invented. It's what we are doing, um, decisions that we make, strategies that we recommend to you, um, objectives that we ask you to focus on are always about trying to make it possible for students to be successful. So we will not talk about things that make it comfortable for us to um, work at community colleges. We'll talk about things that make it possible for students to be successful. And then third, another fundamental tenet of all that we do, we believe in the power of data to inform and help us understand the student experience, to also be able to help us evaluate the strategies and the policies that we use to help improve student success, to keep us accountable, to help you be accountable. So we fundamentally believe in the power of qualitative and quantitative data to help us understand and continuously improve what is done to help students be successful. When we were first created, we had four main strategies or approaches that we were using, and they still remain fundamental to the work that Achieving a Dream does today. We knew that we had to work at the college level. It was critical that we would be able to reach out to those of you who are on the webinar to be able to say, these are the kinds of policies and practices that can be used at your institution that will make a difference. So we spend a lot of our energy working directly with community colleges, providing coaching, providing learning experiences that help colleges improve their outcomes. We also know that colleges can be doing great work, and at the same time, they could bump up against policies that may be set either at the institutional level or perhaps at the state level or even at the federal level that may cause certain activities and things that you want to do not to be feasible because of whatever policy is in place. So we believe it's necessary to work also at the policy level to make sure there's an environment that's conducive to innovation and to focusing on student success and that works on getting rid of policies that really get in the way of doing the kinds of things that colleges need to do in order to help their students. The third area was that we wanted to make sure that we were putting attention to creating knowledge and banking that knowledge in such a way that we can share that widely across the network. The whole idea is to learn from one another's experience and be able to apply that to the next college and the next college's experience so that we are constantly improving what's happening across the country, not only at one institution or two institutions. And finally, we also work hard on making sure that there are engagement strategies built into the Achieve the Dream work and that everybody who is a stakeholder in this has an opportunity to participate in the decision making and the oversight of the work. On the next slide, we show our student-centered model that we use. We basically ask the colleges to focus their energy in five different places, which we believe add up to a combination that will help make it possible for more students to succeed at your institutions. We ask you to work on building strong, committed leadership across your institution at the trustee level, the administration level, the faculty level, the staff level, across the whole organization and get everybody working in the same direction. We work with you to build your capacity to use evidence to improve programs and services to develop that culture of inquiry and evidence. We work with you to work on strategies of broad engagement that bring in the faculty, that bring in the community, that help you engage a broad sector of people who end up caring a great deal and probably would be affected by the decisions that you make. 
We also uh, work with colleges to make sure that you're thinking about this as systemic reform, not one-off boutique type programs, but really looking across the board, what are the institutional policies and practices that broadly implemented are going to have a difference, make a difference for students. And then finally, as we said before, we care a great deal about equity. So we work with colleges to make sure that everything you're doing has an equity lens and that you are constantly monitoring the outcomes of your student groups to make sure that you're closing achievement gaps between various genders, various ethnic groups, uh, perhaps income levels, perhaps uh, night students versus day students. We ask you to look at this in all different directions to make sure that everybody who comes to your camp is so full of hope and aspirations ends up having every opportunity to succeed. Some of the benefits of being part of the APD network um, and the services uh, that you'll receive from being part of the network. So on this slide, you'll see we've, we've laid out some of the benefits um, for being part of the network here. Um, the first one I wanted to touch on is the one in the top left-hand corner, the, the expert one-on-one -on -one coaching. This is sort of the heart and soul of um, the work that we do with our colleges. Um, we use leadership and data coaches. Every college that joins the network is assigned a leadership and data coach. And these are individuals um, from the leadership coaches who might be former presidents of community colleges or senior leaders in community colleges. Our data coaches uh, typically are current uh, staff uh, at community colleges who are working in institutional research or, or in IT. And the coaches work with the colleges um, throughout their time at, in the ATD network to help build their capacity um, in building the leadership necessary to um, affect uh, institutional change um, and to really develop the institutional research and IT capacities of the colleges and to help the colleges build sort of the culture of evidence and a culture um, of focusing on the data to really think about the interventions that the colleges should, should implement to improve student success. One of the things that you've heard Carol talk about it, um, and I'm going to reiterate it, is that ATD, it is a network. And so there are benefits that come to the individual college who are part of the network, but also it, there's a benefit to being part of this network and being part of the collective. We refer to ourselves sometimes as a live learning lab, and so we really try to hone the lessons from the colleges as they move through their student success work um, and bring those lessons back to the network. And we encourage our colleges to share widely within the network. One of the other um, benefits um, to the network is this piece that we've talked a little bit about, is the building that capacity to collect, and analyze, and present student outcome data, creating that culture of evidence. And this is what the data coach will be working on with the colleges. Um, during their participation in the network. So it's not just about building the institutional research and IT capacity at the college, but for all of the colleges engaged in the student success work, it's helping them think about what are the questions they should be asking, the data they should be collecting and reviewing as they plan for their student success work. We also see, um, through, through being part of this network, we have a lot of professional development opportunities. Um, we'll talk in a minute about DREAM, our annual, our annual institute that brings together all the colleges in our network. Um, but we also have a lot of resources on our website through our Knowledge Center um, that brings together a lot of the learnings we've had over the last 10 years, um, as well as what we have uh, an intervention showcase, which brings together the specific interventions that our colleges are using to improve student success. And so you can go online. Um, and look at hundreds of examples of student success interventions and look at the colleges that are implementing them and look at it via institutional type. So you can look at colleges that might be similar to yours and see what interventions they're using um, to see if those might be applicable to your institution as well. We also find for the colleges that are part of the network that they see um, uh, their resources used much more effectively and really leveraged. And so one of the benefits of being part of the ATD network is that the leadership and data coaches work with the college to really bring together the leadership of the college, the faculty, the staff, um, to really think about how they can allocate their talent, um, their, their financial resources, and other resources on the campus to, to meet their student success goals. And I think we'll move to the next slide here. 
one of the things I wanted to talk about um, is the um, way we have structured the participation costs in terms of being part of the network. When colleges join our network, we ask them to make a three-year commitment to the network, an initial three-year commitment. And they will, they'll pay a $75,000 fee, an annual fee, um, during those three years. Julia is going to walk through the application process, um, but one of the documents that you have seen by now is the application guidelines and general information. And so what I talk about in the next minute is covered much more thoroughly in that document, and we're happy to answer any questions. But I thought it might be helpful to provide some examples of the services that colleges receive in that first year of participating um, in ATD so you can see how, how the, what those fees support. During the first year of a college's participation in the, in the network, you'll receive up to four visits from your data coach and up to three visits from your leadership coach. So you'll have a lot of one-on-one -on -one opportunities to work with the coach. They'll be working with you to um, you know, assess where you all are in terms of um, your student success work to help you think about where you want to go and how to allocate the resources and, and organize, your, organize yourselves to meet the, the goals that you set in terms of improving student success on your campuses. We also include uh, five complimentary registrations to our Kickoff Institute that we hold for all new colleges in June of every year. And this is an opportunity for new colleges to come together to learn more about the Achieving the Dream Network um, and to think uh, more deeply and with all of us together about how your institution is going to dive into the student success work. And we also provide through those fees complimentary registrations to DREAM, our annual institute. So those are some examples of, of how um, the services that are provided and what the fees support that you pay into the network. And as I said, there are many more details about this in the general information applica application guidelines document. Um, and so one of the things that you, so we make, ask you to make that initial three-year commitment, and then we strongly encourage and we hope institutions stay on beyond that. And we have many of our colleges who have been part of Achieving the Dream um, for many years. And so if you stay on beyond those initial three years, there's currently a $10,000 fee to continue being part of this network. Um, and again, you receive um, services through Dream, um, through our professional learning events, um, one of the other benefits, too, is that we have a lot of grant opportunities um, as part of this network. And so we have a lot of initiatives that are um, running right now um, currently around faculty engagement, uh, strengthening STEM pathways, helping colleges um, bundle financial and career services support to, for students. So we have a lot of other initiatives. And we ask, and these are only available to the colleges within our network, so there will be opportunities to participate um, in these initiatives, which do deeper dives into particular aspects of improving the student experience on community college campuses. On this next slide, we thought we'd just provide a few examples um, of some of the success that our colleges have seen um, as being part of the Achieving the Dream Network. One of the um, ways that we are measuring outcomes is that we currently focus um, on five outcome measures with our colleges. and so. The benefit of being part of Achieving the Dream is that each college sets its own student success plan, um, but we are all centered on those five principles and the institutional change uh, model that Carol shared with us. And we're all tracking um, at least some of the same outcomes um, around persistence um, from fall to fall um, or fall to spring. We're looking at completion rates um, within the colleges. Um, and so here, these are just some of the examples. I'm not going to read them. Um, we'll read them all, but you'll see, um, for example, Norwalk Community College um, saw fall to fall persistence uh, increase from 57 percent in 2009 to up to 64 percent in, in 2012. Um, and a lot of our colleges have seen these increases in these measures that we use. And as Carol alluded to, we, we have been in the process of uh, strategic planning, and so we'll be implementing some of the new measures, and um, some of these we won't be measuring anymore, but we can go into more details about that if you, if you have questions. And finally, um, for the last slide, I just wanted to mention um, that one of our key professional learning opportunity being part of this network is Coming to Dream, our annual institute. Um, and this is a place for all of the colleges in the network to gather and to share out their progress over the last year. One of the features that I think makes this different from many of the conferences out there is that colleges that present 
have to have at least three to four semesters worth of evidence that the interventions that they've chosen are working. So this is very much an evidence-based um, conference showcasing, showcasing interventions that are having an impact. Um, and for those of you, as, as you know, we have um, for the colleges that are applying to join the network by December 12th, if they make that decision, they'll receive two complimentary registrations to DREAM. So I encourage you to take advantage of that opportunity. And I'm going to turn this over to Julia, who's going to run through the application process and the guidelines. Thank you, Mary. Um, so I'm going to start by highlighting a few resources that you will find useful um, as you go about uh, completing your application. The first is the application information and guidelines document that Mary alluded to earlier. You'll want to read this if you haven't already prior to beginning your application as it details some key dates and deadlines for your first few years within the network and provides information on services you will likely receive as an ATD college and the costs of participating. This document will also provide guidance for each question on the application to ensure that you answer it to the best of your ability and so that you feel the discussion that's happened within the group answering the questions is fruitful. The second resource is the suggested team composition, roles, and responsibilities. We will talk a little bit about this in a later slide, but this provides some guidance on how to select the members for your two Achieving a Dream teams that we ask you to create. So the first of those teams is your core team, and the core team will lead the Achieving the Dream work at your college. And the second is the data team, and that team will lead the data collection, analysis, and dissemination at the college. The third document is a Word version of the application form. So all applications must be submitted online via the link that is provided on these slides and on our website. And just as a side note here, these slides will be made available to you along with a recording of this webinar um, after it has been completed. Um, so we have provided a Word version uh, to enable you to work as a group to plan, save, and edit your answers before you submit them online. And finally, we have provided a contact list for the president and the core team leader for each of our leader colleges. Now, Leader College is an Achieving the Dream institution which has demonstrated commitment to and progress on the five principles of the institutional improvement model that Carol alluded to earlier. So that's committed leadership, use of evidence to improve programs and services, broad engagement, systemic institutional improvement, and equity. They've also shown three years of sustained student success improvement. We really encourage you to reach out to at least one of these colleges to hear about the work that they do as part of their Achieving the Dream participation and to hear how they've done it on the ground and how that's affected their institution. We don't want you to just go from our words and what we think or what we've got uh, quotes from our colleges or the success stories that they've given us. We want you to really talk to the colleges about how they did the work. And you can find all of these resources on our website at the link that's also provided on this slide. OK. So now I'm going to talk a bit about the selection criteria that we'll employ as we're reviewing each application. And then upon uh, acceptance, what each, each institution is committing to. So first and foremost, we look for a strong commitment to increasing student success. So this will look different in each college, and feel free to use as much uh, license as you want to go into however you interpret this. So it doesn't mean you have to have done a lot of work already on student success. You don't have to have implemented any wonderful or innovative uh, interventions specifically. It does, however, mean that you have that you can demonstrate a willingness to think critically about your institution's current policies, practices, and programs and that you're very open to making deep and sustainable changes where they're necessary. We are also factoring into our consideration your college's readiness to do the intense hard work that it takes to actually move the needle and improve, improve student success and equity. Readiness, again, will look different in each college, um, but a couple of the key things we look for are institutional research capacity, and willingness to expand data analysis capacity beyond the institutional research department. We also look for committed leadership, and this 
extends beyond the president to the board of trustees, um, the academic and student services VP, and all leaders throughout the institution. To demonstrate this commitment, as Mary spoke about earlier, uh, we asked for a, an initial three-year commitment to achieving the dream from each college that signs up. Um, after this period, you can choose to continue to receive services and participate in the network on an annual basis at a reduced cost. Achieving a Dream Colleges also commit to working with Achieving a Dream to collect and provide specific data to us, as well as to submit annual reports. In your first few years, these reports will be planned for the coming year or two as you progress. As you progress, the reports will become reflections for your successes, challenges, and efforts over the past year, as well as identifying your focus areas for the coming year. So it's not just about um, what are we going to do moving forward, but it's also reflecting on the challenges you've had and how you can overcome them, and also celebrating the successes so that everyone within, the, within your college community is aware of the progress you're making. One thing I would like to mention at this point on annual reporting and data submission, which I think is very key and some of you may have heard about before, um, is that we've actually been working very hard over the last year to streamline this process and make it less cumbersome on our colleges while increasing its usefulness. Um, so the 2015 cohort will be the first set of colleges to benefit from these changes. Okay. So looking at now at the time, timeline, um, as you know, there are two deadlines. The first is our early admissions deadline, which is December the 12th. Um, the second is the final deadline, which is March the 6th, after which we won't be uh, accepting any additional applications. So the benefits of applying early by December 12th are twofold. Not only will you get to know your status for your application earlier, you'll get to know in January in order to uh, communicate to your college and your board, um, if you choose to, the news that you'll be becoming an ATD college that year, um, which a lot of our colleges have said is a really big announcement for them and they can get really excited about it. Um, not only that, but we will also provide you with two complementary registrations to our Dream 2015 Institute, which was discussed earlier. So those who apply by March the 6th will receive uh, a decision on their application by March the 13th. So the next step for each, every college that is accepted is Dream 2015 in February from 17th, February 17th to 20th. Now this is optional, but we do encourage you to attend, not only because it's wonderful professional development, but it's also a really good way to get your colleagues and your leadership team excited about the work ahead. Um, the next deadline um, will be for the readiness assessment, which will be due on May 22nd of 2015. And the readiness assessment is a really useful tool that we've designed uh, to help our colleges facilitate discussion about their strengths and areas for improvement across a few key uh, areas we have identified from our experience as important for institutional change. So as also mentioned before, uh, in June there will be a kickoff institute for this cohort specifically. So every college that is accepted for participation in the 2015 cohort will be required to attend the kickoff in June. And just a side note on that, we do encourage and hope that all presidents attend this. If you can't, you can talk to us about it and we'll work around it, but that college presidents are very, very strongly encouraged to attend that. So the final deadline for your first year will be your planning period work plan. So this will be for how you go about researching and using your data to identify key challenges your college faces and identify which of these challenges you feel you would like to address in your first few years within Achieving a Dream. So now you can see on your screen the suggested team compositions for the two teams I mentioned earlier, the core team and the data team. I'm not going to read each out, um, but our experience has shown that this grouping of people is, at the minimum, uh, 
the most optimal for, make, for an effective team. So a wide group of stakeholders need to be involved, and not only involved, but also empowered. So each institution interprets this in their own way, and each team has a leader. So some of our colleges choose their president and another person to be the leader of their core team to make sure that their president is involved and updated on everything that's going on. Others choose faculty members to lead the team to really get the faculty on board with the work that's going on. Okay, so at this point we're going to stop talking at you and we're going to hope that you have some questions to ask. Um, as I said, we will be providing these slides and the recording of this webinar to all registrants um, probably later on this week. And they'll also be on the website for those interested in hearing it again or looking over the slides and getting the links. So Mary, do we have any questions at the moment? So if you have any questions, um, you can type them into the question pane on your screen and we'll respond to them verbally. Julia, this is Carol. If, uh, if we're waiting for some questions to come in, we know some people had some things ahead of time that they were interested in. Um, one of them was, as I understand it, some of the folks were interested in whether or not ATD could help them with fundraising in order to cover the cost of being involved in achieving the dream. And I could say just a word or two about that. Um, sure, go ahead. We're, we are um, very happy to try to help you in any way we can. We know that many of the colleges have tapped into um, They've gone to maybe local community foundations to request support. Some colleges have looked to some of their federal grants uh, where they've got some set-asides that can be used for equity grants or for serving um, certain population groups on their campuses. They've been able to tap those funds. Some of the uh, uh, colleges have gone to their own foundations to get the resources. We've got quite a battery of communications materials that we could give you. Uh, we could advise you on some of the uh, ways of, of arguing for support, of making, building your case. We can provide you with more examples of some of the outcomes that other colleges have experienced so that you can make a strong uh, um, case for why you want to enter into this work. We are always scanning the horizon for funders that are looking to invest in new colleges. At the moment, we don't have investors who can just uh, are open to national expansion of Achieving the Dream. But in certain cases, there are some places that are targeted. And we're uh, more than happy to help work with any of you who are in some of those target areas. That's generally what folks have done. Um, folks have found that they can do a simple return on investment equation for themselves by thinking about what is the probability that they're going to increase student retention and then calculating if there's so many students that they believe they'll be able to retain that previously were dropping out of college, calculating what that would mean in terms of returned revenue from tuition and from full-time equivalency allocations from the state and then show that they can pay off that initial 75 investment very quickly by retaining X number of students. That's a, there's one college in particular that's done a really good job of calculating that return on investment. If that would help any of you, we'd be willing to share their formula with you and see how very simply they calculated they needed to retain 225 students to pay back their investment in the first year. Okay, thank you, Carol. I think we had a couple of questions coming in. Um, the first of which was to repeat um, the institutional model for, institu for institutional improvement. Um, so if we can, hang on. So Carol, do you want to just talk a little bit about this again and see if we have any more specific questions about this? Sure. So 
Uh, these are five areas that we uh, focus your attention on and provide coaching services around uh, to help build capacity. On the committed leadership, this is part of having the right people on your teams to work, but also having strategies for bringing other people into um, the leadership positions and, and helping to make decisions about what's going on. For sure what you need to do is to make sure you've got faculty and staff leaders that are committed to this work. Because after all, they're the ones that are going to implement any of the strategies or changes that you may ultimately decide to make. So that's that component, just making sure everybody's on board and buying into the success agenda. The evidence one is where we help you build up your data capacity to be able to do the right kinds of data analyses uh, and, and help you build the capacity to understand all the data that you have. Every college is sitting on a ton of data. Um, there's probably more data than you can possibly get through in a year's time, but we can help you focus in on what types of data and what types of data questions are going to make the most sense for your understanding the student experience and for your understanding where you need to make some changes or improvements. The broad engagement one is really about making sure that you have strategies for getting the right straight stakeholders involved in the discussions. So helping you with perhaps your ability to run focus groups with maybe with faculty, maybe with members of the community group, certainly with students. Uh, we work with you to give you some suggestions on how you can bring those different voices into the uh, equation and help build a stronger commitment across the board. The systemic institutional improvement area is where we ask you to think about not small programs that are going to serve maybe 50 students and last only as long as you have a special grant to support them, but rather think about the kinds of policies and practices that will, that will affect large numbers of students and can become part of the fabric of your institution. As an example, uh, one of the things we always ask colleges to consider is ending late registration. All of your students are registering. Some of you may have policies in place that allow students to register as late as two weeks into the semester. And you're probably doing that out of a concern that students have busy schedules and they, they can't always get there on time and, they make, and maybe their aid doesn't come in on time. What research has shown is that when we put students into a class two weeks after it's already started, they are coming in behind their peers, they struggle to keep up, and more often than not, <coughs> they are not successful. So unless you have a no late registration policy, so everybody starts at the beginning, or you have strategies in place for catch-up, um, maybe having a semester course start two weeks after the, all the others start, and then put your late registrants into that brand new course that starts from the beginning. Unless you have things like that in place, um, you're really not going to be able to see how to close that uh, that gap that students have, so many students come in late and within several weeks are gone because they're just struggling too hard. That's one example of many things you could do across the board that will impact large numbers of students and will be a permanent change at your institution. And then the equity is really about doing a careful job of analyzing and tracking what happens to your different student groups so that you can be constantly monitoring and understanding whether you're closing the achievement gaps. Most every college that we've worked with has had some group of students that's not performing at the same level as other groups. Even if you're in Appalachia and all of your students, 99% of your students are white, you may have differences between age groups. You may have differences because of what feeder school uh, students attended at high school level. You may have differences in gender. Uh, some some Colleges are seeing differences between students that take online courses or that take regular courses. Whatever those student groups are that are performing or attaining at levels lower than uh, others on your campus, uh, those are the kinds of gaps we want you to focus on and come up with strategies for closing those. 
Thank you, Carol. So, leading on from that, we've actually had a question about the IR element of this. So, the question was, can you describe an optimal IR office for an APD college? Well, that's going to vary from college. I don't know that we have an optional. You know, we've had colleges come in to achieve the dream that have had no IR offices. That was many years ago. Actually, I think achieving the dream has been responsible for there being a, a, a greater awareness across the country of how critical the IR office can be, what a great asset it is to the college. But we have had some that start with zero or maybe one person. Larger colleges in better resourced areas may have five, six, seven people in their office. So it's hard to say what is optimal, but I would say this, that we work with you from whatever point you are at. If you have a small IR staff, or overworked, undoubtedly overworked office, because that happens everywhere, then we work with you on strategies for how you can build data capacity in other places in your institution faculty groups, for example, maybe your math department, maybe some of your other sciences have people in there that are comfortable doing data work. And there's ways that you can engage them in some of the analyses so that you're, you're drawing on the IR folks for expertise, but you're not expecting them to do every single data analysis for you. We'll work with you at whatever level you're at. Thank you. Um, we haven't had any more questions uh, from the group currently here, but we did have a question uh, from one of the registrants when they registered um, asking about what professional development opportunities exist as part of the ATD network. And I just wanted to address that quite uh, quickly. So we've already discussed quite a bit about um, our annual institute on student success, which is DREAM, which takes place in February every year. There is really no better professional development for your faculty, staff, and administrators, and presidents, and even boards of trustees sometimes um, than going to DREAM. Um, this is really where the colleges learn from each other. Um, the people doing the work on the ground come and share their experience and their success stories and the challenges they face. So there's really no better professional development than DREAM. Um, but we also as well as that and our knowledge center, which has a lot of the resources that will help your uh, colleges to move forward, the coaches will also provide assistance in setting up professional development for your college. Um, so whether you need professional development on how to analyze and use uh, data within a decision-making structure, your coaches will be able to help you design uh, that kind of professional development so that all you can to deliver it to a, a larger audience or a smaller audience, depending on how on your needs. Um, obviously, the Kickoff Institute is good professional development for those um, who attend as well, though we don't encourage you to send 20 uh, people from your college to the Kickoff Institute. But it will, for those who attend, really give you the basics of what achieving the dream is, what it means to be an achieving the dream institution, and what you'll be doing going forward. And that will give you the tools you need to provide that uh, professional development and that information to the rest of your college. Julia, I could also add that under the strategic planning we've been doing this year, we have, um, we have come up with, we've come to the conclusion that there's other ways that we can offer professional development experiences going forward that maybe we haven't done in the past. So in the planning stages and things that will happen on uh, during the term of the 2015 cohorts experience, there, we are working on optional learning events. For example, we want to put greater emphasis than we have in the past on working in the area of teaching and learning, curriculum reform and pedagogy reform. Uh, since we have not put a lot of our emphasis on that, except at the developmental education level in the past, we're anticipating that we're going to hold uh, optional learning events where we bring in some of the nation's experts on curriculum and pedagogy. And colleges would have the option of sending uh, a team of people to those kinds of events. We also offer webinars on different topics that you can tune in on. Uh, another thing that we anticipate doing in the future is having something we call data summits. 
uh, many of our colleges have had all-day events for their institutions where they present key data and give the faculty and staff a chance to wrestle with making meaning out of the data and discovering what's going on with their students on the campuses. Knowing how to run a big data summit is something that we can share and, and show you how to do. And so we anticipate that we'll have uh, a learning event dedicated to helping everybody understand how to run a big data summit. Last summer, uh, we had a grant from the Kresge Foundation, uh, or at least one of our partners did, where we had a data analytics conference. And so we were able to send about 60 different people from ATD colleges who wanted to participate to this summer institute where they learned more about how to use data analytics. We're working with a number of IT ven uh, vendors, and uh, they are uh, coming up with strategies and ways to um, work with our colleges at discount rates for some of their products. So there's some of those things that will happen for beefing up the capacity in the IR area. And uh, I just think in general what you can expect to see is that besides the basics that your fees would cover, the dream and the kickoff of those experiences, you'll find more and more optional events that you can weigh in on and all you'd have to do is just get your people to go there. Okay. So we've had one uh, other, question, other question since you started speaking, which is are you able to join the Achieving the Dream Network annually or do you have to wait every three years? So we do this application process every year, um, so you can apply. Um, it's an annual opportunity. You don't have to wait um, for every three years. However, given the urgency of the work that we do, um, we encourage anyone who's considering it to apply as soon as they can, as soon as their college can apply. Um, we encourage you to do so to get the work started. Okay. So unless anyone has any other questions, and if you think of questions afterwards, you're more than welcome to contact myself, Julia Lawton, or my colleague, Mary Harrell. Um, the contact information is on your screen now. Um, and as I said before, we will be providing you with the webinar recording and the presentation through an email to all those registrants, and it will also be on our website. So unless well, there are any questions. Uh, Julia. Yeah, I'd just like to emphasize one of the points you made early on when you were encouraging, either you or Mary, I apologize, I forget which, encouraged colleges to contact a leader college to talk to them about their experience. I think that's something that everybody ought to give serious thought to, regardless of where you stand on this, whether you think you're ready to apply or whether you think you want to wait. Uh, so there are 79 leader colleges now in our network, so there's bound to be one that's in your neighborhood or that has um, an institutional student composition that resembles yours. We can help match you if you ask for that. We've given you the list of who they are so you can contact them on your own. But if you want to say, I really want to talk to a rural college that has had whatever, fill in the blank, we can help connect you. These folks will tell you both the bad and the good. They'll tell you what worked, what didn't work for them, and that's the way you're going to get really a good sense of the power of this work and why you might want to do it. Um, so we ask that you uh, consider that strongly. Those folks are more than happy to talk about what they've experienced, and they'll give you great insights to consider as you make your decisions. And just as a side note to that, um, you are all welcome to bring a team to our Dream Institute in February. Um, you don't, even if you don't apply, we're more than happy for you to come and experience what Dream has to offer. OK, so if there are no other questions, I'm going to let you all go a little bit early. Um, and thank you for being on this call today. Um, we really appreciate your interest. And if you have any additional questions, please feel free to call me or Mary. So thank you very much and have a really good day.